Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tobias Matei. I'm the deputy editor of the North American Spine Society Journal, and I have the pleasure of having with me here today Dr. William Lavelle, who is the senior author of the article CT based bone mineral, mineral density as a predictor of proximal junction of fractures, an article just recently published in the North American Spine Society Journal. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, Dr. Lavelle. And would you like to first perhaps introduce yourself? discuss a little bit about your practice and maybe some uh, of your research line and what you've done so far and how you ended up um, deciding to investigate this very important topic of proximal junction kyphosis in deformity surgery. Sure. Hi, I'm Bill Lavelle. I'm uh, one of the spine faculty at uh, the State University of New York in Syracuse, also known as SUNY Upstate. Um, I uh, have been here for about 15 years uh, and uh, I'm our spine fellowship director. Um, I have a, a, a practice that uh, is, uh, entails degenerative and deformity surgery. I do surgery uh, for adult patients and pediatric patients. And uh, with that really comes the, the, the topic of proximal junctional kyphosis. Uh, the topic winds up being pertinent because uh, as one of my mentors uh, had said, uh, Izzy Lieberman, uh, we're, we're all deformity surgeons in some way. We're either uh, uh, treating deformity or creating it. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the issue with proximal junctional kyphosis is one that has uh, just become um, more of a mainstay even in general spine surgery. Um, people just get to be sicker and sicker and uh, come with more and more complications. While it's a, a testament to the difficulty, it's also the testament to success. I mean, people with uh, difficult problems are simply here longer for us to, to take care of. And uh, it just really makes our, our job harder, but uh, it winds up being you know, something that, that hopefully helps out society, so. Perfect. And we, uh, all of us that do the formative surgery know how frustrating it is uh, to do such type of very complex procedures. Sometimes as a patient with previous uh, multiple lumbar uh, surgeries and a flat back, and we do all our multi-level uh, T-leaves, cages, uh, PSO, and everything goes all right. And a few months later, the patient is back to the sagittal imbalance and we're extending our T10 to pelvis, probably to a T4 to pelvis. And sometimes you go a C7 to pelvis. So we know how can them, them be a can of worms. So definitely it's a very important topic. Uh, and would you be able to give us the general idea maybe about the methodology of your study and the main findings? Right. So our, our paper was actually a uh, paper that had come about from a, uh, an abstract that we had presented at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery years ago. Um, it, was, uh, it was an area that, uh, that, that for us was, was interesting, um, just trying to see who, who it is and how it is that we could predict failure. Um, many authors have, uh, have published on the topic. Our series uh, at that time was very small. Um, we wound up uh, collaborating with, uh, with Ohio State and uh, put together a, a series of patients uh, for us to look at retrospectively. Basically, it was uh, an opportunistic idea. Uh, many of our patients had preoperative CT scans and opportunistically looking at the CT scans for us to uh, try to see if, if there is a, a threshold value um, specifically or a predictor um, for us to see who would, who would uh, have a proximal junctional issue. And I know we'll get into a little bit as to the difference between fractures and, and simple proximal junctional kyphosis. Um, during the time of the development of that paper, others have, have published on the topic. And, uh, you know, one of the satisfying uh, components was uh, some of our numbers seem to agree. Um, and uh, particularly numbers that are put forth by uh, David Pauly and, and, and uh, Paul Anderson. So. Perfect. Uh, if you want to explore a little bit and, and we can present to our listeners, uh, we're all familiar with the difference between proximal proximal junctional kyphosis and proximal junctional failure, or I think in your article you define as fractures. Uh, but you would you provide the, the technical definition that you use in this paper and explore a little bit of the incidence of each one of those phenomena? Right. So we, we defined uh, proximal junctional fracture and proximal junctional kyphosis differently. Um, proximal junctional kyphosis we defined as a, a 10 degree change from the preoperative uh, x-ray findings uh, to the postoperative x-ray findings. A 10 degree change from the bottom of the upper instrumented vertebrae to the uh, 
vertebrae that is two above or UIV plus two. Fractures were just that. If, if a patient was seen to have a true fracture, um, then they were defined as a, a proximal junctional fracture. Um, the reason being is, is, is um, on, on twofold, anecdotally, fractures uh, at least tended to have uh, um, more neurologic problems. Uh, the failures tend to be more catastrophic. And there are times where, where patients can have simple proximal junctional kyphosis and not necessarily require more surgery, not necessarily require um, intervention symptomatically. Um, and at times they do. Uh, it, uh, it, it, but to, to me, the one, they, or to us as, as, as a study, um, the fractures were, were, were considered to be more catastrophic. So would you be able to kind of give us a, a brief uh, sketch um, of the main findings of your study and what were the difference between the control group, uh, which I assume are the patients who did not develop either proximal junctional kyphosis or failure, and then the PJK and the PJF in terms of uh, the bone mineral density as measured by the CT scan? Right. So the, the, the bone mineral density as measured by the CT scan was measured in Hounsfield's units. Um, these were simple preoperative uh, CT scans. They were not quantitative CT scans. In other words, there, there were not uh, dedicated phantoms that were used in, in particular. Um, so they were simple Hounsfield's units that would be utilized in day-to-day in -day opportunistic CT scans. Um, both groups, the kyphosis group and the fracture group had statistically significant differences, but the um, uh, fracture group was was much more remarkable and 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 probably much more consistent with uh, with with findings by others. So the uh, the the proximal junctional uh, kyphosis group um, wound up having a uh, a value that uh, that while statistically different uh, wasn't dramatic. The fracture group we tended to find that uh, whatever level was measured the UIV plus one UIV plus two or the the, the vertebrae that was the upper instrument of vertebrae, um, anything less than uh, 130 Hounsfield's units was, was found to be problematic. So the, uh, if, if we look at UIV plus one for the fracture group, the uh, average was 126. For the control group, the uh, average was 170. Now there's numerous readings that are in the, in the paper and it really depends upon how they were measured. We measured them both on the axial, mid-axial plane and on the sagittal plane uh, for the for the vertebrae. So, do you think that there's uh, we could maybe based on on such factors and, and the findings that you found, uh, I would say a, 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 a greater degree of osteopenia or osteoporosis in the patients with fractures. Do you think that maybe support um, some theories that uh, having proposed that proximal junctional kyphosis is not only a problem of the anterior column, but maybe related to some of the laxity of the posterior uh, uh, spinal ligaments? Yeah, I, I mean, I, 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 I think that one of the things that we find is, is, is that patients become more osteoporotic, um, that we, we find that it isn't just the bone that fails them, it's the soft tissues as well. And I think that's, that supports some of the, the, the current strategies that we have for proximal junctional kyphosis. I tend to, to end up doing almost everything that is available. So uh, Kebaishi, I think from Hopkins, he started doing several years ago, uh, vertebroplasties uh, at UIV plus one. And it seems to make a lot of sense for me because you create that transitional level between your instrumentation the kyphoplasty level or vertebroplasty level, which is unlikely to fail. And then you hope that the level above is still um, are going to behave as a, as a normal, the normal biomechanics of the thoracic spine. I know in the past few years, there have been a lot of attention to working also with the posterior tension band. I've been doing the polyethylene tether, and I know Dr. Farhadi uh, has been very excited about the hooks. He was actually in attending when I did my fellowship at the Ohio State University, so I remember him doing those cases. But uh, would you be able to comment, what are the implications of, of your findings maybe for some of these new techniques um, that have been proposed? I know we still don't have long-term data, uh, but it, in my opinion, at least take, taking account the um, the relatively low cost of such techniques and the almost catastrophic nature in terms of um, the, the proximal junction, especially the proximal junction failures that require uh, 
revisions and extension of diffusion, sometimes several levels above. Uh, would you be able to comment on, on such techniques and your opinions and maybe your preference sure. on what you, you currently do? Well, I, 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 I've, I've been a fan of, uh, of hooks at the top of my construct. I, I, I had done that for years. Uh, Frank and I actually wound up uh, talking. Uh, I, I think that was one of the impetuses of how we teamed up to do this. Um, the, uh, the one of the surprising findings is is, is that uh, amongst the data set, we did not have a lot of patients that had hooks, but the ones who had hooks still failed. Uh, so we did not find our hook strategy to be very protective. Um, again, to mitigate that, it was uh, there was not a large number of patients in the study that had hooks, but you know the idea, the theory is 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 still such that trying to preserve the the posterior tension band in the midline. And sneaking a set of hooks up on the sides is is a way to try to transition into the into the more normal and more mobile spine. Um, I think that anything to supplement the posterior tension band is probably a great idea. I think that uh, trying to pass mersling tape sometimes is uh, it to pass mersling tape and not yourself disturb the posterior ligamentous complex. Trying to do the passing is is sometimes easier said than done. I, I think it's um, one of one of the areas that innovation will uh, really um, change things. Uh, um, every time you go to a, a meeting, a spine meeting, a deformity meeting of any kind, uh, there's different ideas, and uh, and hopefully one of them will stick. Um, the other idea with regards to supplementing the vertebral bodies with with methacrylate uh, is is a great one. Um, one of the problems with that has always been that when we would do kyphoplasties and vertebroplasties for osteoporosis is, is by supplementing the vertebrae with the cement, we are making them more dense, but that also may just simply kick the problem up to an, an additional higher level. Um, it, would be, uh, it would be nice for us to, uh, to be able to say it's just one thing. I, I will tell you that my overall 10,000 feet uh, appreciation from practice and also from this paper uh, has been that uh, really the best thing to do is to, is to pay attention for it and to uh, identify that the patients who are at risk. And you know, one of the other findings of the paper was this is that the deformity patients, particularly with sagittal issues from the get-go, tended to have more problems. And there is a difference between uh, someone who is who is getting a, a surgery for deformity in, in terms of their risk of developing a proximal junctional issue than there is for somebody who winds up with that same number of levels for another reason. So if, if, if they don't have a deformity issue and they're instrumented there, obviously you can do egregious things, put them in positions that would put them at risk, instrument them in non-functional ways, such as instrumenting them very kyphotic or instrumenting them very lordotic abnormally, but knowing that when you're taking on the deformity patient that they are at risk and properly counseling the patient as to what they're getting into and yourself raising your acuity and suspicion that you may run into a problem. So I understand your study. Basically, you evaluated all these measurements that we have in terms of deformity. They are all preoperative measurements. Am I correct? Yes. Correct. And one of the things I think that there's enough evidence in the literature, it shows that postoperative residual kyphosis or a postoperative residual sagittal imbalance is definitely a known risk factor for, for PJK. So that's, I think it's, it's an important lesson that if you suboptimally correct a patient, those patients that are much higher risk of, 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 of PJK. Um, I guess the harder question know. is, is if you, if you wind up with a patient who's not quite perfect, do you pull the trigger to do more? Correct. And I agree with that. I mean, I had several challenging cases that the patient had an A-leaf, L5-S1, L2, L3, L3, L4. And the only level I could play with was between the paddock of L4 and the paddock of L5. So I had to do a, an extended PSO, both uh, inverted and the standard PSO. And you get some good, good 30, 35 de degrees at that level. But uh, we all have done these big surgeries. And at one point after three or four liters of blood loss and six, seven hours so, of surgery, and you get your x-rays and you have your measurements of PI and lumbar lordosis, at one point, sometimes it's a hard decision. 
to know when to stop and avoid clinical complications perioperatively or when to stick to your measurements and try to get those additional 10 degrees. So Great. Um, what about your uh, the, the cases that were included in the study? Were they all uh, T10 to pelvis or they were all similar or did you have cases that stopping the lower lumbar spine, for example, L2 to pelvis? Yeah, so there were five levels. If I remember correctly, there were five levels and they had to go to the pelvis. So um, five levels mean that they were they were um, at the junction, um, but but some of them did stop at L1. Okay, because I don't know what's your experience, but at least in my experience, I've done a few cases of L2 to pelvis, and those are the cases that I fear the most about PJK, uh, both because you're still dealing with a relatively mobile level, um, instead of, of anchoring your construct in the thoracic spine. So especially in those patients, and especially if they are uh, female patients after uh, postmenopausal, those are the patients that I strongly consider in a kyphoplasty. But I don't know if you personally have noticed this a difference between the, the T10 to pelvis versus the L2 to pelvis, for example. Yeah, so the, uh, in, my, in my experience, I, I would agree that... Uh, that stopping in the lumbar spine with someone who is an at-risk patient, and I specifically look at um, at their Hounsfield's units on their CT scan, and I, I also look at to see whether they have by World Health Organization definitions of osteoporosis or even osteopenia, and I do. I counsel them, and if 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 I find them at risk at their thoracolumbar junction, I'll extend them into their thoracic spine. What's your threshold for crossing when you're doing a deformity surgery and you're no, doing, for example, a, a, a lumbar a pedicle subtraction osteotomy? Uh, what's your threshold for extending up to T4? Because I've seen a lot of, especially the, some uh, orthopedic colleagues, that um, they the cases that they worry the most about PJK or PJF, they say, oh, I'm not going to stop at T10, I'm go all the way to T4. And, and I have to... Um, to uh, to tell you that I'm a little bit more conservative in, in the sense that, I mean, most of these patients, the problems start with a L4, L5 fusion, and then you ended up with something like a two or three level instrumented fusion. And then you may have to pull the trigger from a T10 to pelvis, but at least I want to avoid at all costs ending up with a C2 to pelvis or, or, or some situations like that. So I think it's very unlikely that I'm going to indicate uh, more levels of instrumentations because of the fear of PJK. I, I worry when they have preoperatively frank thoracic lordosis. Um, so if if I see someone who is, when they're trying to stand, they have frankly lordotic in their lower thoracic spine, you know, I'll, I'll extend them to four. That's one of my criteria. Um, one of my other criteria is, is, is if, if their previous fusion that has failed or that has made them flat already takes them close to 10, I'll take them to four. So in other words, if, if somebody's had a, um, you know, let's say they've had a, a fusion that has gone from, they've been fused flat from L, you know, one to L, excuse me, L1 to the sacrum, they're, they're already flat. Uh, to me, their posterior elements have already seen uh, damage and destruction from trying to lordose through that area. Uh, I'll, I'll tend to pull the trigger to take them up higher. And my other one is, is just, just that. I'll, I'll look at their preoperative CT scans and I'll check their Hounsfield's units. And if, if I'm happier at four with the number that I get, then, uh, then I will extend them up. Plus one of my other tricks is, is if I'm forced to operate on somebody who is more at risk, like let's say somebody is, has, has a um, known osteoporosis, they have a, a house fills units that are uh, below 130. Um, I'll try to use multimodal fixation. In other words, I'll go a little bit old school. They'll, they will wind up with, you know, occasionally in the midst of their construct, they'll wind up with sublaminar bands or sublaminar wires just to try to get multimodal fixation to prevent their screws from pistoning and failing in that manner. Um, but those are always a bumpy ride because you know going in, if you're forced to operate on that particular patient for tumor or trauma, that uh, that it's 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 hazardous waters. Perfect. And um, would you give us an idea of what you think it's the next? Uh, what are the, the the hot topics that we should be paying attention in terms of investigating uh, proximal junctional kyphosis? And I say that because I mean I think your study is very interesting. We have we we all suspected that 
osteoporosis play an important role in proximal junction kyphosis, but uh, to have that demonstrated in this relatively uh, large series, and especially showing that this it can be meaningfully measured in a routine CT scan uh, instead of having to order a DEXA scan um, or other type of additional testing is very valuable. So uh, I think everyone that is listening will keep that threshold number that you gave us, the 130. Um, uh, and that said, the UIV, am I correct? Yeah. Or UIV plus one? Yeah. So what are the next, I was asking, what are the next uh, steps in terms of research that you think we should pay attention? I, I think we should look at whether the other things that we do, just as you mentioned earlier, make a difference. So we talked about strategies that we as surgeons can do. Um, I think the other thing is, is, is that what happens when you elect to wait and try to medically optimize patients? And does their medical optimization make a real difference? Uh, I know there's been some studies that have looked at that to, to some degree to argue one way or the other, um, but you know that the, does 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 our our medical efforts make a difference? Because it's one thing to fix their bone mineral density. Uh, even in our study, if you look, there was a statistical difference in measures of comorbidities, such as Charleston comorbidity and the ASA score. Um, can we really do a good job of making these patients medically better so that they run into less problems? And I think that that's very important because in terms of trying to improve our, our surgical outcomes, uh, for most of the deformity patients that I treat, I wouldn't honestly mind postponing their surgery for six months or a year. These are patients that usually they have chronic flat back. Most of them are not neurologically symptomatic in terms of radiculopathy. So you're mainly treating deformity. But I can tell you that at least anecdotally, I, I have a a few patients that I've sent to an endocrinologist, they were on Fortel or Prolia, and lo and behold, a year later, they come back with a DEXA scan, almost the same as before, and they end up going for surgery. So um, it's been a little bit frustra uh, frustrating to me to see that those patients, it seems to be a chronic problem. And, and even for good endocrinologists at, endocrinologist at a tertiary care center, uh, it's not something that sometimes they can optimize the patient, at least in the in the relatively sh short term, like six months or a year. Great. Perfect. Anything else you would like to, to comment on your study or maybe future research that you're planning in the area of deformity or any other message you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, no, I would just say that uh, we're, we're, we're all in it together. And I think the more we collaborate and the more we talk and the more there are venues like this to, to, uh, to have dialogue on it and share ideas, uh, the better off we'll be. It's a great pleasure to, to have you with us today. Uh, Dr. Lavelle, I appreciate your time and uh, thank you for submitting this uh, interesting article to NASJ. Thank, thank you for publishing it. And thank you for having me.